Going over Grandmaster games is a great way to improve at chess, but especially after you've learned the 16 strategic variables of the middle game, the 10 fighting principles, the 13 tactical themes, and the 8 controlling moves, which I'll be doing videos on later. That way, when you go over the games, you can come away with ideas that you can use in all of your games, and not just in a particular game. It's also very instructive to go over mismatched games between stronger and weaker players like we see in this game between world chess champion Magnus Carlsen against a B player. It was played in a simultaneous tournament last year. In this game, I hope you can walk away with about eight strategic ideas that you can use in all of your games. Chess games start out with a balance of power, but with the first move, white has an advantage in time and usually uses this advantage to gain some center space as Carlson did in this game with e4. Black usually responds with e5 matching white's center influence. But in this game, the B player played d6, not influencing any of the two center squares in white's territory. It's a more complicated opening, and I hope the B player knows what he's doing. Black hopes to chip away at white's center later on in the game. The game continued with d4, Carlson says, hey, you want to give me the center? I'll take all of it. Knight to f6, attacking this undefended pawn. And Carlson just solidly defends it with, with f3. There were other choices, of course. Bishop to d3. And this looks like a violation of opening principles. He doesn't develop a piece. He moves one of his kingside pawns, or he's going to be castling. But I think this is a strategy that he's using against the lower rated player and in this simultaneous tournament. He does, just doesn't want to give Black any tactical ideas. It also takes him out of any opening knowledge that he may have. And because the center isn't going to be opened anytime real soon, White can get away with a little more passive approach in the opening. He'll have time to develop his kingside pieces. Now Black plays c6, continuing with his passive approach to the center. And Carlson grabs even more of it. Now black plays g6, which will allow the bishop to develop on g7 with the eventual influence down the center. White develops the knight to c3. Bishop develops. Bishop to e3, defending the center pawn again. And black castles. Knight to e2, knight to d7 for black, queen to d2, which allows queenside castling if necessary. And now here we have the first, uh, a6 is the first positional threat of the game. A slight one, but if he's allowed to play b5, it will open up his position a bit. It will give his bishop some place to go. It'll weaken the d5 square a little bit after this pawn captures. So Carlson clamps down on that right away with a4. You have to always ask what your opponent's idea is behind his last move. Of course, as you improve, you'll be looking at these things well in advance and see what possible threats he can make, the direction of the game, where he should be thinking about long term, and also short term. But then you have to decide what to allow and what to prevent. If you can get away with preventing his ideas without losing anything in return, then you should probably shut down all of his ideas if you can, but usually that's not the case. You more often have to give something to get something. But here Carlson decides not to give him anything so far. It does weaken this b3 square, which means this square can no longer be defended by pawns and its potential outpost for an enemy piece. Because this rook is still undefended, Black can't continue with this plan to b5. He could just capture, and he won't be able to recapture because of this undefended rook. And now Black plays c5, starting the attack on the center. And now we have another major decision to make. Should we allow this, or should we close the center by playing d5? Carlson decides to close the center. And again, I think, and I think he does it again for a strategic reason, to not give Black much activity with his pieces, and not give him any clear plan. And then he's more likely to make a positional error, which the better player will be able to capitalize on. The weaker player might not even be aware that he's doing it. At the end of the video, I'll make a list of the ideas I'd like you to come away with. 
like the positional threats, the weak squares, chipping away at the center. Okay, so now black plays knight to b6. So he had a choice to play to e5 or b6. He wants to attack this undefended pawn. Before you make your move, you should evaluate it generally and specifically. I mean, the knight over here is on the wing, and that's generally not a good thing. He has less mobility there because he's further away from the center. And you also have to ask if your plan can be stopped. He's attacking this undefended pawn, and you should know how your opponent's going to react to that before you make your move. And then also look at his possible counterattack and also know if you're giving your opponent one of the controlling moves of the game. I list all of those in another video on Chess Tactics, the six power move strategy. If you haven't seen that, go check that out. If the black player had asked all those questions, he would have chosen e5 instead. I always say you're only as good as the questions you ask before you make your move. And these questions are the same in every game you play. It's a long list, but there are about 28 questions that are absolutely essential that you have to ask before you move. Okay, so Carlson defends it with a discovered defense with the bishop, moves the knight here. And black plays e6. Okay, now we're going to see what was wrong with this knight move here. White has an opportunity to win a pawn. Why don't you pause the video and figure out how to win a pawn here. Okay, so Carlson begins this combination by playing a5, power move number five, little guy harassing big guy. He has to run. And now pawn takes, exposing this undefended pawn. And the knight throws an in-between move. And now the queen is defending this pawn, which allows white to capture the f7 pawn with check. Knight to e5 was probably best because otherwise the queen would have been able to capture the d6 pawn and then this pawn becomes weak and he recaptures with the rook. And now if you do a power move evaluation, you see that this queen is undefended, which actually allows a tactic here. The bishop can actually take this pawn because this pawn is pinned. But Carlson didn't do that. He probably saw it, but capturing it would allow black some more activity again. That's my guess anyway. So instead, he played bishop to e2 he still has to develop his pieces and castle. That was probably another consideration because when you capture something, you lose time. And now black attacks this pawn two times. A gang attack, two against one. What would you do as white here? Why don't you pause the video and check it out? Okay, Carlson decides to plug up the works. Knight to d5, blocking that attack. And black captures now, which way do you take? Do you take with this pawn or with this pawn? Pause the video and think about it. There's a general rule here which applies. But remember, specifics are always more important than the general rule, but you need both to help guide your play. Okay, he takes with the C pawn, which keeps this long chain intact, which is generally what you want to do. All else being equal, now the bishop runs. White castles. And black plays b5, which allows en passant, which Carlson does. And queen takes. In every game and throughout the game, you have to decide where you're going to concentrate your forces to get a force advantage, one of the elements of the game. And the center, when the center becomes locked, you play on the wings, on the queen side or the king side. And I think black had options. He could have played h, h5. But he chose to fight over here on the, on the queen side. And of course, you can always go back and forth if you have time. Attack on both sides. Sometimes you're attacking everywhere. Now this pawn is attacked once, defended once. He could gang up on it. And also this bishop could be revealed on this pawn. Carlson blockades this pawn. He's going to go after it. So here's black's weakness, this undefended pawn here. Black defends, which is a passive move. You always have to ask yourself, 
whether you should defend or go on the counterattack. He could have played rook here, putting pressure on this pawn. But the game continued. Now he's got three attackers. He's got three defenders on this pawn. And black plays rook to c7. The idea of maybe pushing this pawn through, maybe after he's won this pawn. And now Carlson plays h3. We have to look at why he did that. Is it to give his king an escape square? Or he's planning to push f4, which would prevent the knight from sliding in here. Now black goes to that b3 square, that undefended b3 square. And the rook chases the queen out which is generally what you want to do. If your opponent enters your territory, chase him out, all else being equal, because things start to compound in chess. And now he does pop that knight out. Again, the same rule. He's getting him out of his influence into of his territory. Repels the knight. And which revealed, by the way, I have to point that out. Yeah, it reveals this a gang attack on this pawn, two against one. So he moves the target. And black relocates the rook here, putting pressure on this pawn. Bishop solidifies this pawn, freeing this rook from a defensive roll. And x-rays the king. Every time your opponent moves, you have to look at all the x-rays as well. Once these pawns start rolling, it becomes a possibility for this attack along this diagonal. The knight slides over for reasons unknown. And now Carlson plays e5, hitting the base of the pawn chain. And he's already attacking this pawn once and was x-rayed by the bishop. If he can get rid of this pawn, then he can win this pawn. Breaking down pawn structures is a common maneuver used by advanced players. All else being equal, you want to weaken pawns so that you can win pawns. When you go over Grandmaster games, you'll see that this is a common idea in them. And now we see a real blunder. He blocks the defense of this pawn, which allows white to capture with an attack on the queen. Rook takes, rook takes. The queen runs. And the tactics have begun. Why don't you pause the video and see how you would continue as white here? Okay, you should look at what you're already attacking and then try to apply more pressure there. So this pawn is being attacked twice, rook and pawn, and it's defended twice. Of course, you need to be hyper aware of this x-ray on the rook. So Carlson slides in to e4 with the knight attacking the pawn three times now. Black moves his king, gaining out of this potential discovered check. And now white is free to capture that pawn. Rock, paper, scissors. Yes, this knight is undefended, but the queen is being attacked. Knight takes, revealing this attack on the rook. So, what to do? You throw in an in-between move, of course. Attacking the queen. Knight takes, tit for tat. You take my queen, I'll take yours, but he didn't calculate this through. White is one step ahead. He takes the queen, and now if the knight recaptures the queen, the rook has many options here. He could take this rook, he could take the bishop, and wipe out the black camp. So it's game over, but the game continued, actually. He didn't take the queen. He took the rook. The queen ran, attacking the rook. The rook runs. The queen pins the bishop on the back rank. The rook defends. His last gasp effort of black. Queen slides in, attacking this pawn two times, keeping pressure on this bishop. That's what you do. You go around and mop up pawns. Bishop to f6, defending the rook. He's trying. He's struggling. Bishop attacks the undefended knight. Bishop attacks queen. Queen runs, attacking the rook, keeping pressure on the bishop. It's all about to fall. If this knight falls, queen can take the bishop. And under this extreme pressure, black blunders horribly with bishop to d4, which allows the queen to capture the rook. And now he resigns. So what have we learned from this game? One, be aware of positional threats. 
I mean, actually all threats, tactical threats, etc. But in this game, we're looking at the positional threats. Two, chip away at the center with pawns if your opponent has an advantage there. Generally, you want to neutralize your opponent's elemental advantages. Three, ask how your opponent will counter or respond to your threats and attacks before you move. Four, avoid passive defenses, which relates to five, which is to seek counterplay instead of passively defending. Six, break down pawn structures. Seven, when given a choice about how to recapture with a pawn, choose the one that maintains your pawn chain, all else being equal. Eight, get enemy men out of your territory. One of the hardest things in chess is knowing when to do what. So you have all of these ideas and you have to see what's the most important thing at this given moment. Remember when Carlson played h3? He had time to do that. There wasn't anything else more urgent at that moment, which allowed him later to play f4. Almost all of these points will occur in almost every game you play. Make sure you look at the video on how to find tactics and combined with these tips, your play will improve immediately. I guarantee it. Talk to you later.